Well, well, praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Inman, and you're now listening to the Word of Deliverance. I want to thank you for listening to our program. You may be a first-time listener. If you are, stay tuned. I think you'll like this. Michelle, we got a great program today for the people. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is talking about two cups in that, in that chapter, and I think it's very informative. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, we know that the first cup they're talking about is communion. Right. And the ideal is in this chapter, there's two cups, and they both talk about the fate, F-A-T-E. And that comes about the destiny of a person in drinking of these cups. I remember when I was a child going to Bible school, <laughs> You know, our vacation Bible school, I think if it was, if I'm not mistaken, we were taught on the cup that they had back in the book of Genesis when Joseph had them to put the golden cup or the silver cup, I think it was, uh-huh. into Benjamin's bag. Right. You know, this was cool. It was all right. Mm-hmm. But I wonder why they never brought this out. Bring it out to us today. And let's tell the people about the amazing facts about two cups. Amen. Well, I'll start with, first of all, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, the cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He says, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, he says, But I say that the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. He says in verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the devils. Okay, Michelle, let's look at this cup of communion that we talk about in verse 16. Now, you notice in verse 15, for those that are listening, he talks to wise men. He's not talking to everybody here. Amen. You know, there's a lot of people ignorant of this today. In 1 Corinthians 10, 15, Paul talks to the wise men. And he tells them to judge what I say. Okay, we want people to listen very carefully because this is important. The cup of blessings, Paul said, that, that we bless, and this is in verse 16, Uh, it's the communion of the blood of Christ, which is full of his blood. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important if we look, uh, the bread which we break, he said, is this not the communion of the body of Christ? So let's bring it out to the people. I want you to tell them, first of all, what this, why this cup is so blessed. Mm-hmm. I mean, for us to get into this deeply, it would take a lot of time. We don't have that on the program. Right. But if you look at Numbers chapter 5, we can tell them the idea without really going there. Mm-hmm. But there's a woman who was an adulterous woman in Numbers chapter 5, and this woman never repented. She claimed her innocence all along, and she was willing to drink from the cup maybe, and if she did, the prophecy says in Numbers chapter 5 that her bowels would rot out. Yes. She would be done. Amen. You know, but the idea of is here, the blessings in verse 16 is those that drank from the cup and they repented. Yes, they confessed their sins and repented of their sins. In other words, sins. they had an option either to drink from the cup without repenting, without repentance, or they could turn around and repent and this cursed cup which had the curses in it, it would not affect them, right? Right. And um, that's what this is all about today, which those that have repented and are partakers in a communion with Jesus Christ, they are blessed and they will receive the promises of blessings upon their lives, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, having the being full of the Holy Ghost. And those are the true blessings and being able to commune with the body of Christ. And it says the communion is 2842. That's in the Hebrew, right? In the Greek. In the Greek? Okay, yes. using Strong's Bible Concordance. Yes. In the Greek, it's 2842. Yes. And Tell this us what that means. Word is comes from the word communion, and it means partnership, participation, social intercourse. Then it has the word pecuniary in there. Okay, the pecuniary means what, money? Yes, it means that you cannot 
do this or fellowship or break bread for money. You can't have money involved so in it. So this is about Christian fellowship. Yes. And he tells you that you cannot have anything that pertains to money mm -hmm. relating to this, right? Right. And this is also says contribution and distribution and fellowship. And it all leads to, um, and it goes to 2844, it says sharer, associate, companion, fellowship, partaker. Then it goes to 2839, which is common. And you go, looks in the book of Acts chapter 2, when they came together and breaking bread and they had all things common and they shared by all everything they, sh they had, they shared with one another. And as everybody had need, they gave them as they needed it. And it wasn't nothing that they did out of um, whoredom or wanted to um, access, wanting, just wanting out of lust. Well, this is the royal law that James mm -hmm. talked about in cha chapter 2, verse, I think it is around 8 or 9. Mm-hmm. James talked about the royal law, about loving the brethren. Right. So once a man is saved, Jesus Christ is in him. Yes. He's the hope of glory, and Jesus Christ is in him. And no matter how low down you think he is, you have to help him. Amen. And you have to help him because Jesus Christ is in him. And you know what? That's what he said in Matthew chapter 22, around, what, 37 or mm -hmm. something like that? When he said this, he said, The greatest laws are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, with all thy might, and with all thy mind. And to love the brethren is a second of the greatest commandments. Yes. And that's really important that we love one another. But you see, today, the blessings of God cannot come upon you because you're going to church and you love Jesus. You know, you have to give your money to hear these people tell it. Some of these uh, great preachers in America that have these uh, gigantic churches and are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. You have to give your money to them to get their blessings. It's like a reaping and a sowing. Mm -hmm. You give to these rich preachers and then the blessings of God come on you. Right. Or you can't love Jesus because you give your money. That's not what's going to save you is by giving money. Oh, I just love Jesus because I give my money. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a lot of corrupted ideas. Mm -hmm. But the real ideal here goes into verse 21. Now, I know that... You know, this verse 16 talks about the blessings, and you could look at the blessings. We could talk about that a while. Matter of fact, let's talk about that just a little bit more. The blessings would include what? Being filled with Jesus, yes. having a relationship with Him. And having the knowledge of Him, like in Colossians 2.2 2 and 2.3, have the knowledge of wisdom of Jesus Christ. Those are the true treasures and the true blessings so of God. So that comes from Colossians 1 verse 27. Yes. Where Christ is in us, mm -hmm. in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, yes. says that in him is the treasures and the wisdom, and this is all of the wisdom in the world. Yes. So it's there, but how does it come out of a person? There's a lot of people listening to us right now mm -hmm. that are born again, but they go to churches that are really not preaching the Bible, and I feel sorry for them because... The poor pastors, they don't know either, a lot of them. They right. don't have the time to put in this like we do. So tell us how to bring this wisdom and knowledge out of a person if they've been born again. Well, first of all, get a King James Version Bible. And then you want to get a Strong's Concordance. Um, and then you get that and then you learn how to study, read the Bible and study the Bible. In First Timothy, First Timothy 4, 6, also... Um, talks about educate. Yeah, educating yourself. But the word yourself. is used nourished. Yes. In other words, you're telling them here about a Strong's Bible concordance. Mm -hmm. You could also use a keyword study Bible because yes. it's got partial Strong's built in it. Right. So anyway, learning how to search. And I know that everybody can't do this, but, you know, if you can, this is a way to, to stay with the scriptures. Yes. You nourish up yourself. First Timothy 4, 6. The word nourished in mm -hmm. that verse mm -hmm. means to what? Educate yourself. Yes. And how do you do that? It's with the Strong's. Study. You just told them about with mm -hmm. the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. Now many people are destroyed according to Hosea 4, 6 from a lack of knowledge. Amen. So you have to say that we're blessed because of our fellowship with him. And remember, David said, I once was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the for righteous forsaken nor his seed Begging bread. Amen. And remember in 1 John 1, he says, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, 
Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not in the truth, do, do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Okay, let's bring it out to the people like this, Michelle. Because if you look at this very carefully, we're blessed mainly because we're born again believers and we're blessed because of faith. Amen. I want you to tell the people about, let's use for example Matthew 19 and talk about how great our faith is and what it's based upon because Jesus told this man, I mean, faith is not for everybody. Right. You know, we know that faith is greater and there are some people cannot have faith if they have their values in the wrong place. Yes. Because there is a specific idea in the scriptures that people are required to do before they can walk with Christ Jesus and there is no exceptions of persons. Yes, there was a rich man in Matthew 19 who asked Jesus, he says, what must I do to that I may have eternal life? And he says, well, I do this and that and this and that. Jesus says, all that is good. He says, but thou lackest one thing. Jesus says in verse 21, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And then he says that the man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. In verse 23, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Perfect. And then he says, um, and their disciples was amazed at this. And they said, who can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Okay, he says the word perfect here, Michelle. Is that 50, 50, 40, 6? Or which word is that? Because I think this is an important word. Because everybody's going to look and say, well, I can't be perfect. So we can drop that. But yeah. that is not what this word means. Mm -hmm. We know that Christians are supposed to do their best. Is this, this is 5046, and this goes to the word complete and mental and moral growth okay. and character. Okay, here's the ideal, mental and moral growth. You only come from this, and like I said a while ago, in 1 Timothy 4, 6, you find the word nourished up, and that's to educate. Yes. And mental growth, it means to be able to be educated, but mm -hmm. the education of God cannot be... You, you cannot compare anything with it because right. God, you are born of a royal person who has miraculous faculties that comes in the word gifts. Yes. And whenever God gives you the gift of himself, there's mm -hmm. miraculous faculties in a person and he can outgrow this world and he can know things that's above this world. Yes. Come but on, tell us. You have to be full with the Holy Ghost because a lot of people can have the scriptures, but then they'll twist the scriptures up. So you need to stay full of the Holy Ghost in order because the Holy Ghost will lead you into all truth of whatever the scriptures has says, like in St. John 16, 13. He will tell you the things that you should know. Okay, this number 5046 in the Greek mm -hmm. is always used for the word perfect. Yes. And it means mental growth, which we just, just discussed. What about moral growth? How does this work and how does that, I mean, uh, you have that, to understand the world has their standards. What's your standard? Well, that comes with the mental growth. You have to grow mentally in the scriptures in order to grow morally because we base our morals upon the scriptures. What does the scripture say? What does the Bible say that I need to do? And that's how we have our morals. So Hebrews 9, 14 also deals with that, doesn't it? Where it talks about the blood sprinkled our, our conscience, that we have a higher level of knowledge. Yes. We know more about sin mm -hmm. than the average bear will say. Yes, because our conscience bears witness with the word of God. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to jump down now and uh, tell us about verse 18. If we look at this carefully... Uh, I think we'll have to know that there's something going on here. 18 through 21. Tell us what it says. It says, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they, are not they which eat the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in the sacrifice to idols is anything? Okay, let me ask you something. I don't mean to interrupt you there, but there's sacrifices 
is uh, partakers of the altar. Now, they don't serve God. If you look back into the Old Testament, the sacrifices they gave, they got, I mean, people actually served a different God here. Yes, and even Isaiah tells you, uh, chapter 1, that they're, they're, they was full of sacrifices, but God was sick of it because they was just sacrificing, but they had no repentance and they wasn't serving God. They was actually sacrificing the devils. Okay, and Fifth, in verse 16, the communion year had nothing to do with money for those Christians who were washed in the blood. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the cup of communions that were forgiven. Yes. So here, go on and read where you was because there's a different idea in verse 20 and 21. Yes. But I say, in, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of the devils. Okay, the table of the devils. I want you to explain to this. Now, we as Christians are not allowed to base anything upon money. That's right. what it said, right? Yes. No exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, what about the word devils, D-E-V-I-L-S? Because many people out there listening to us today don't know how to put this together, so they're scammed. And what I mean by scammed, they're sucked in to believing that Jesus Christ is this God here that they're portraying mm -hmm. in verse 21 and 22. It's called devils. Tell mm -hmm. them what it is. Well, if you look at the word devils, it's 1140 in your Greek Strong's Concordance, and it's a demon spirit. And if you look, go on to the second level root word, it's talking about 1142, which this demon spirit distributes fortunes. In other words, we're looking at a Christian in verse 16 who is not allowed to do anything with money. Right. Okay, you look at Jesus. He was a poor person. His disciples were all poor. Mother of Jesus offered up two doves, two pigeons, and you can look at in Leviticus chapter 12 and find out this was for people that could not afford a lamb and things like that. She had no money hardly. Correct. So when you look at this very carefully, Jesus did everything by faith. Yes. It's like we talked about yesterday's program on the end of it, that he fed the multitude in, uh, there outside of, uh, of Bethsaida, I think it was. Uh, and know what it was in the last, in the 10th verse of... Um, Right there in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 10. Anyway, he fed the 5,000. Or maybe it was Capernaum. I'm, I'm maybe a little mixed up there. But the whole idea of the thing is that you don't, he didn't need any money. In Mark, chapter 9, it says they had but 200 penny worth of bread. Mm -hmm. So he did not need their money. If God be for you, who can be against you? I think that verse, when I mean, you look at this, you find out where they were at. And it was in verse number Yes, Man. they was in a city called Beth Bethsaida. Or Bethsaida. Bethsaida. And that was the ideal of it. This mm -hmm. is the reason I wrote that down. In chapter 11, it talks about a woe coming to Bethsaida. Bethsaida, Bethsaida because, you know, he, they saw the miracles. They saw him feed the 5,000, but they did not use their faith, and they knew he did not deal with money in this instance. He, right. Yeah. I'm sure there's many people out there don't understand this idea, but Christians are required to live by faith. They're not allowed to follow this other cup. It's the cup of the devils, and they have convinced people, oh, we need $100 billion so that we can preach to everybody in the world. The facts are they're not preaching to everybody in the world. Their names are not on one mm -hmm. food bank list. Mm -hmm. They're not on any homeless shelters. Mm -hmm. And with $100 million a year, they could take a country like Venezuela and bring the country out of the doldrums. Yeah. They could take another country like Spain and prevent them from going bankruptcy or Greece. You know, it's just not happening. Right. It's a mental scam that people are supposed to believe, and it's supposed to be our God. Now explain it to them again. This is a cup of the devils. Yes. And you said in Strong's Bible Concordance, if they look in the number 1142, you can find it's very apparent. It's right there. It's the distributor of great fortunes of money. Yes. And also, if you look up the word drink, I like that word too, is um, actually cup. The word cup is like a drinking vessel and the contents thereof. So if you're drinking from the cup of the devils and you're with all this, you're going to get everything that's involved 
in this cup. So if there's a price to pay for drinking the cup of the In other the words, you're talking about if you jump into the money bed. Yes. Okay, you can find a little bit more about that if you go to Revelations chapter 17. I think it's around verse 3. This golden cup. Is yes. that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the cup of gold. Don't destroy that. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell us about it. Well, we'll see here, actually in verse 4, Revelation 17, 4, a woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And we see that um, in verse 2, that who had drunk from this cup was the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So in other words, a relationship with them, but we better tell the people now, let them figure this out for themselves. Let's tell them who this woman is because he says here in Revelation 17, what is it around verse 10 when he says don't, when he admired about the woman? And the angel told him, come and I will show you who the woman is and I'll show you the beast. What did he say about the woman? Yes, that's in verse 7. And he says in verse 7, an angel, wherefore dost thou marvel? And he says, I will tell them the mystery of the woman. Now this woman you're talking about here had the golden cup, right? Yes, this woman did. Okay, tell us about this verse 7 and the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her which had the seven heads and ten horns. Mm -hmm. now, we don't want to get into the seven heads and ten horns right now. We can. We do. But we don't want to talk about that right now. Let's talk about this woman. Uh, first of all, um, it uses a word here in verse 5. Tell them what this means with the mystery Babel and the mother of harlots. Well, this woman had upon her forehead was a name written, the mystery of Babylon, the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay, I want you to tell the people how they can go to the Hebrew section of Strong's Bible Concordance and look in the number 2181. Yes. 2181 is going to open your eyes to tell you what's happening now. And you know, you're not supposed to know this. So those of you that don't want to get, you know, messed up, close your ears till we finish this <laughs> Hebrew number here. Because some people want to know who this is. Yes, this number is 2181. And it has in the middle of it, it says, Figurative to commit adult idolatry. The Jewish people being regarded as the spouse of Jehovah. The spouse of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So that happened over in, what, Exodus 24, verses 6 through 8, when they yes. married Jehovah. And they got in covenant. They got You'll, in covenant. Jeremiah, they broke the covenant. You'll find Ezekiel 16, they played the harlot, they played the whore. You'll find that all throughout Ezekiel, um, how they played the harlot. Okay, let's ask the people something else. They've always played the harlot. When did they get into the money? Where did this word usury come from? That comes from Daniel, I mean, Genesis chapter 49. I want you to prove it to us. Go to Genesis 49 verse 1. Because Jacob said to gather his sons together, I want to tell you what's going to befall you in the last days. Skip verse 1 and go to verse 17. Okay. Because that's Genesis 49, 17. Now those of you that are listening, hold on to your hat. You're going to find out how to verify this. They've always really had this problem with money. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 10, 21 is just kind of, you know, closing up the gaps. Right. Well, it says in Genesis 49. Under the word biteth? Yes. Tell us what it says. It says in Dan, verse 16, Dan shall be a judge, shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. And if you look up that word biteth in the um, Hebrew Strong's Concordance, it's 5391 in the Hebrew, and it says to strike with the sting as a serpent, figuratively to oppress with interest on a loan. Okay, interest on a loan. When I was a kid, 3% would get you in trouble. Today, we got 29.9 on the charge cards across America. Is it designed for the rich? It's designed for the poor. Well, it's designed for the rich to use. Against the poor. Against the poor. Yes. So now you're looking at the ideal of Jesus. He says, 
in Luke 4, 18, he's anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Yes. These poor people today in our country are being oppressed in every way there is, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And it's all about people that are behind the scenes. They're not going to tell you who they are. They're behind the scenes making the laws. And you look at this control of this country that, you know, they're oppressing people. Yes. And just another uh, example of how this woman is to prove. It tells you even Revelation 17, verse 18. He says, And the woman which thou sawest is this great city which reigneth over the kings. And if you look in Revelations 11, 8, it tells you who this great city is. In Revelations 11, 8, it says, And their dead bodies, these are two witnesses, um, then their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we know that our Lord was crucified right there at the outskirts of Jerusalem. Well, people that today, Michelle, they don't, are not allowed to talk about this. You know, they have to talk about something positive so they can get money out of people because that's what they need for the great programs that TBN uh, or Hollywood, whatever you want to call them, where they own it and they have to get great money together because it costs great money. Right. And I wonder why it costs great money. Yeah. Well, we noticed that even in Dan Tanet, I believe, <laughs> is behind the scenes. Because remember, in Genesis 49, it was for the last days. And so these are the last days. And he's the one that's supposed to be judging his people or the people of Israel, it says in verse 16, as his tribe. And then if you go on, it talks about he's behind the oppressing with the interest on the loan and the usury. And so how, what, how they're doing this today. Okay, what about Luke 6.35? This is a puzzling scripture to some people. And you find out that <clears throat> he says something specific there. And you have to look up the root word again to find out what it means. In Luke 6.35, what does it say? He says to uh, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. Okay, it's not means that you give people your money and you don't you lend it to them and don't look for them to repay it. The word lend here is talking about oppressive interest on a loan. So this is what Jesus forbid in the New Testament. Tell us what Matthew twenty three fourteen refers to, Michelle. Quickly, we're out of time. That's how he had they devoured widows' houses. Yeah, they did it because they could not pay mm -hmm. the interest on the loan, maybe when their husbands had died. You find the same idea in Second Kings, but we'll talk about that later. I hope you enjoyed our program today. If you'd like to get a copy of our program, why don't you email us or call us. My name is Pastor Inman. You can also write to us and use the date you hear this program. You spell my name I-N-M-A-N. And our address is 518 Pleasant Valley Avenue. Dayton, Ohio, 45404. Again, my name is spelt Pastor Inman, I-N-M-A-N, and that's 518 Pleasant Valley Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 45404. Why don't you be a partner with us? We send our partners, we've got a two or three only, uh, and we send them programs like this every month. We send them what the Scripture says. And it's not popular opinion that we're out to help, but we're out to feast on the Word of God because that, what, that is what nourishes Christians up. You can email us at pastorinman at att.net. You could call us at 937-235-0246. 937-235-0246. You can lay up treasure right now by supporting a, a program for one day or for a whole month on some of the channels we're on. If you want to know more about that and lay up treasures in heaven, <clears throat> write to us and become a partner with us. I want you to pray for us. Even if you can't do that, you might want to be a partner with us anyway. As I said in the program, you can't base this on money because God is greater than any of these things. And the faith that you get by believing on Jesus Christ through fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit will take you farther than money ever goes. Remember, I believe your faith is what keeps you in the grace of God. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's very important. Again, Pastor Inman, I-N-M-A-N, 518 Pleasant Valley Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 
Have a great day. You've been listening to the Word of Deliverance.